Tonight, we're going to zero in on the present moment, the coronavirus, and talk about strategies for left and unions in coming out of it in favor of working people. We're really lucky to be joined tonight by Leo's long-term collaborator and co-author, Sam Glinden. This series has been hosted by The World Transformed and Verso Books over the last two months. Huge thanks to both of them for all the organizational support. We currently have more than 100 people on the call, which is really amazing. So thanks for joining us. And my name's Kyla. Uh, and my name, uh, the same as it has been for two months, is Mihao. Um, the world has changed dramatically in the space of a few short months. Um, I think we've all felt that the coronavirus pandemic has spread across the world claiming lives and exposing so many of the weaknesses of our world that are regularly swept under the rug. Uh, we've seen how capitalism is unable to meet basic needs without massive intervention, uh, and who is really essential in making our world run. Poverty, low wages, high rents, precarious work, state institutions that have been destroyed by neoliberalism, all of these have been magnified and laid bare by the virus. Even if and when, uh, even if or when a vaccine is found and the public health crisis subsides, we will be left with a social, political, and economic crisis uh, larger than anything since at least the Great Depression, if not longer. Tonight, we'll ask Leo and Sam to walk us through today's overlapping crises and help us think strategically about how the left should respond in these truly unprecedented times. So as mentioned at the outset, we're lucky enough to jo be joined tonight by Sam Gindon. Sam was research director at the Canadian Auto Workers Union from 1974 until 2000 when he retired. He is co-author of The Making of Global Capitalism and The Socialist Challenge Today, both with Leo Panich. Leo Panich is Emeritus Professor of Political Science at York University, co-editor with Greg Albo of The Socialist Register and co-author with Sam Gindon of The Making of Global Capitalism. His new book, co-authored with Colin Lay's Searching for Socialism, the project of the new left, uh, the project of the Labour New Left from Ben to Corbyn is out now with Verso. Uh, and has been their best-selling book recently. Uh, congratulations, Leo. Um, as we did last time, we are going to run through tonight's webinar as a long question and answer session. Uh, so we're going to spend hopefully something around an hour to a bit more with Leo and Sam. We'll start with a few initial questions of our own, but after that, we hope that you'll do a bunch of the work for us as always. Um, there's a chat uh, to the left there, to the right, um, and we're watching for questions as they uh, come up. So please post them in the chat and we'll try our best to include them in the discussion tonight. All right, so I'm gonna kick off with the first question, which is mainly just for Leo, uh, which is really just about drawing on a lot of the lessons that we've, we've come out of from your book over the last few, three or four sessions uh, in looking at the trajectory of the New Left Project and you know, how rapidly it, it turned to the right and what the risks of this warn us about any project that we're trying to embark on now to transform the party and that, how quickly that can be undone. Um, so a few weeks ago, we talked about how Kinnock had actually been accepted by the left um, in the wake of a crushing defeat um, because of the policy, uh, because you know, he was acceptable in terms of his policy position, but also because of this overriding narrative of the need for unity and that kind of the goal of election win winning would dominate all strategy and policy focus. Um, but you know, soon after he was brought in as the party leader, this led to the complete marginalization of Tony Benn and the left within the party. So thinking about these lessons, um, we've already said this is a really crucial time for the left and how we respond now will really determine our balance of power within the party for years to come. Um, so in light of this, we've seen how when Starmer was elected supposedly as a uni unity candidate um, and who was prime ministerial, who is, you know, potentially who can win us the next election. Um, but now last week we saw his expulsion of Rebecca Long-Bailey after her sharing an interview with Maxine Peake in The Guardian based on quite a disingenuous claim that this was an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Um, so I'd like to get what's your reading of the event in the last few weeks and how should the left respond both in terms of the socialist campaign group and the extra parliamentary movements? Well, I, I think the situation is uh, quite different from what it was uh, when Kinnock was elected. Uh, as you were indicating, Kyla, um, Kinnock uh, came along to Labour Party conferences uh, quoting uh, Gramsci. Uh, he was introduced at Labour Party conferences by Eric Hobsbawm, who was still in the Communist Party. Uh, 
uh, Kinnock's alliance intellectually was with Marxism Today, the Communist Party journal. Now it's true, all of them drifted as they marginalized the Benite left in the party, all of them drifted towards paving the way eventually to Blairism. That's true. Uh, but at the time, a good deal of the activist left uh, was behind Kinnock and, and, and taken in by this. Uh, in the current situation, what Starmer is making it so clear is that he doesn't have a socialist bone in his body. Uh, he doesn't even have an ambi ambitious policy bone in his body. Uh, probably Ed Miliband is on the far left of the shadow cabinet now that Rebecca has been expelled. Uh, and, and Rebecca's expulsion, I must say, I mean, I as a Jew, and very proudly a Jew, have been noting that uh, the uh, Israelis had been passing on uh, uh, some police measures, not only to the Americans, but the South Africans that they've been using recently. This is not an anti-Semitic statement. It's an astonishing thing that this would be done. And it's obviously an indication of the lengths to which um, Starmer will go to position himself as acceptable to the British state and to the American empire beyond it. Uh, so things are very clear, much clearer than they were actually uh, initially in 1983 for even five, at least until Kinnock turned on the miners. Um, so uh, things are very clear and, and I've had comrades here say to me, uh, so won't people now be leaving the Labour Party? Shouldn't they be leaving the Labour Party? Shouldn't the socialists who uh, created the world transform, the momentum, and were behind Corbyn, shouldn't they be leaving the Labour Party and trying to create a new socialist party? Well, this is not how things happen. Uh, a group of socialists don't get together and put on a badge that says, workers of the world, give us a call. Uh, they happen out of institutional realignments. And, and uh, uh, as Colin and I say at the right at the end, the last page of Searching for Socialism, uh, it's very unlikely that the British left uh, will not continue to operate within the Labour Party for the foreseeable future. However much what's happened seems to confirm Miliband's, Ralph Miliband's conclusion that it's an illusion to think the Labour Party can be transformed into a socialist party. I think people will stay in, and I think what's been very interesting is that the fight that has taken place for the, over, over the leadership of momentum uh, indicates that people were trying to, in the wake of what was apparently uh, going to be a Starmer victory from the time that uh, the Corbyn was defeated in the December election, uh, people decided to concentrate on what they could change. Uh, and, they, and what they could change was momentum. Now, I think it's a mistake uh, to think that changing momentum and indeed identifying landsmen as the enemy and so on is going to take you very far. Uh, I think that that's mistaken, but I think that Forward Momentum's platform was outstanding. And I think, moreover, that the majority of the candidates on Momentum Renewal entirely were taken by it and were impressed by it and endorsed it. Uh, so the initiative was taken and is a good initiative. The question will now be, whether it, as momentum launches into what they say will be a campaigning strategy, a strategy of political education, whether this will lead to expulsions. And if it does, will that lead to an institutional break with the party? It would only be viable, of course, if it took some unions with it. Uh, and that would involve changing unions like Unite, which are very little politicized at the base, as we know. Right? Th this is now the key question, I think. Uh, it, it, I don't expect this in any short order, but one should be aware that this could happen if momentum becomes the kind of campaigning organization uh, that it wants to be, the kind of organization that is going to transform the political culture of constituency labor parties at the base will not be initially concerned 
with winning tiny victories on the NEC or winning a resolution for this or that policy at party conference, knowing that this leadership won't implement it. Uh, the, the question is, what will the tension be as momentum moves in this direction in a creative way, which I'm sure the World Transformed will help it do. Uh, uh, so that's what I think we need to be looking for. Uh, it's not impossible uh, that out of this, uh, a socialist party could yet come. It's arguable, and Colin and I say this in the book as well, that had Corbyn in April agreed to a deal with May around Brexit, uh, around a soft Brexit, which she would have gone for and left the Tory party divided, that 100, 150 Labour MPs would have left. And then the Corbyn leadership the socialists would have been left with the party apparatus, which still would have needed to be changed, of course, in a very drastic way. Uh, but they didn't do that. Again, the left took party unity on its own shoulders, as the right never does. Uh, and we are now in this situation. Uh, but it's one that I don't think uh, it is, should be seen negatively, not least because Starmer and the people he's got remaining in the shadow cabinet are so clearly uh, careerist, uh, not socialist, uh, very cautious politicians at a time when the world doesn't call for that. Yes, yeah, I think we can, uh, we'll turn to that world now. But thank you, Leo. That, I think we should keep that sort of institutional context um, in mind uh, when looking at, at the next questions and, and talking about um, what's going on, which is the coronavirus crisis and really um, two major overlapping crises, right? So we have that public health crisis of a global pandemic uh, caused by exactly the type of virus that epidemiologists have been worried about. Um, and then on top of that, we have an economic crisis. Uh, that results from capitalism's sort of fundamental inability to rationally implement the measures needed to contain the spread of potentially deadly infections and stave off the collapse of healthcare systems. Um, I think initially we all saw that the crisis led to a kind of, you know, redefinition of who and what is essential in society. Uh, we saw the care workers, food service workers, sanitation workers, um, all sorts of service workers uh, normally, you know, thought of as sort of disposable by the higher ups. Um, labeled essential and labeled essential broadly within society. We also saw, I think, a redefinition of what we can collectively afford. Um, and states everywhere, including in the UK, have rapidly mobilized unprecedented spending and programs, uh, you know, even nationalizing the wages of entire sectors of the economy so workers could stay home. Um, now, however, it seems that we're entering a new phase. Um, you know, Amazon and other companies have already rescinded the pandemic pay they grudgingly introduced, uh, even those $2 per hour, you know, were, uh, were too much for them. Um, and we're being told, I think most starkly here in the UK and in the US, uh, that the economy has to be prioritized over uh, the cost of health or at the cost of health, right? That these are competing interests. Um, so those, you know, glimmers sort of from March and April of something different seem more distant today. Um, I think we'll start with Sam on this one, but we really want to hear from both of you sort of what, you know, generally, what, what does this tell us about the way um, out of the coronavirus crisis, that's uh, the way out that's being driven by capitalist elites, um, what, what we can do, how we can organize to get some of those uh, glimmers back, even if they were just sort of glimmers. Um, and, you know, there's a very broad question. We can get into some specifics around unions and green transition. We really wanted to start with your thoughts on how to situate uh, this crisis and sort of working class resistance to it. Um, and we'll see if Sam. Yep. First of all, I just wanted to congratulate you for how great these sessions have been. They've been a pleasure to, to watch and learn from. Uh, I, I think what part of what you're getting at, Michal, is that there seemed to be a, almost a social democratic sensibility at the beginning of this uh, pandemic. And uh, I'm not sure I would call it a glimmer. I mean, the result of it, it, it wasn't because we were so powerful that we got it pushed because we had the social base to push it. And it wasn't because elites had suddenly had a change in their mindset. It was absolutely necessary in terms of dealing uh, with reproducing capitalism. Uh, people had to be paid to stay home, to get around the pandemic. And uh, the economic infrastructure had to be saved for later, which involved the state. 
And I'm not sure that that's going to end. I mean, this is going to be very uneven what happens from here on in. But to the extent that uh, the economy just recovers very unevenly, to the extent that the pandemic rises again as it's rising in the States where there's a second wave, there is still going to be a need for a lot of these kinds of measures from the state. Uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean this indefinitely, but for the next year and a half, maybe that'll happen. And I, then I think the question will be, uh, and, and also with Biden getting elected, I think there's going to be a question in the states of Biden having to try to consolidate his base and not do uh, introduce the kind of austerity that sets the foundations for the Republicans returning. So there may be this kind of opening that continues, um, but we will ultimately be confronted with the fact that to continue it uh, is going to polarize the question of what that means in terms of the budget deficits, for example, and how you deal with uh, the incredible increase in that deficit. Uh, and it's going to mean either having to go further or retreating, I think. Uh, once we're back to normal, and there's questions of whether private industry is investing and whether capital is leaving. And uh, at that point, I don't have a lot of confidence in a Democratic, in either Biden or a Democratic Party that defeated Sanders advancing. So I think that there will be a crunch at that point. What I do want to say about this moment is that I guess rather than a glimmer, I see it as part of the contradictions of dealing with this is that it created certain openings. And I just want to maybe give some examples of those openings because they're openings of the kind that we can fight around and build on and build the kind of understandings and power that really will build the base for dealing with the crunch when it and as it comes. So just some examples uh, around healthcare in the States, obviously, uh, th there'll be more support for a national, a universal healthcare system. But it goes beyond that. There's the question of that, that what we've learned in the pandemic is that a lot of the healthcare system is still really privatized. The drugs are under the control of commercial interests that value risk differently than society would. And the same goes for having the equipment, all the protective equipment ready. So there's those kinds of questions to deepen how we deal with the healthcare crisis. Um, you know, the, the, the protests around racism that have just happened that are so important uh, also raise the question, not just of policing, but the fact that there's more black people, far more black people shot by other blacks than there are by police, which raises the question of the decay in those, kind, in, in those communities around poverty and all the questions about health and education and the kinds of things that would have to happen uh, to deal with those larger problems would involve a class alliance. It would actually involve taking both racism seriously and class seriously. On the environment, uh, people seeing how unprepared we were for the coronavirus can't help. There's an incredible opening to get the message across that you know, the pandemic that we're really facing are in the middle of, and that is what much more serious than the coronavirus, is the environment and how unprepared we are for that and what it would take to take the environment seriously in terms of the kind of interventions. Uh, in terms of finance, uh, if we don't get at limiting finance in one way or the other, we cannot build socialism in any way. That is you know, a serious disciplinary measure on what we can do at all moments. The situation we're in right now is that although we want ultimately have to make finance into a public utility. We don't have the power to do it now. It's not even clear that we have the capacity to run finance if we took it over. But what it opens the door to is to say there has to be a quid pro quo for the bailouts of finance, for all the money that is flowing to finance. And that quid pro quo uh, can take the form of at least creating a couple of public utility bank, public banks that will deal with infrastructure and the environment, a Green New Deal, financed by levying all banks. If they get money when they're in trouble, there should be a levy on them as they come out of their trouble. And second of all, they can't be allowed to say, well, now everything's okay and we're gonna take money out of the country and take it where we can get the highest return. There has to be a limit on what they can do. So it means we begin to impose and have that discussion of imposing limits on capital and how we control it 
and of creating public institutions that eventually can, uh, can limit uh, the, uh, finance as an institution more generally. Uh, another thing that I think should be raised is the question of a wealth tax. What happens in all these cases where there are these national emergencies and there's an unevenness in who's actually suffering and who's able to maintain what they had before is that dramatic uh, things happen, especially in the tax system. In the Second World War, the top tax rate was as high as 94% in the US and generally high everywhere. Uh, there were excess profits tax and it raises the question of a wealth tax. I mean, it is criminal to, to think in terms of 1% of the US population having more than 90%. Uh, this is just, this isn't democracy to see this kind of thing happen. So there's all kinds of potential in terms of mobilizing around this. But I do wanna say, I don't think that a wealth tax will solve the problems. The point of a wealth tax is first of all, to get the discussion of inequality on the agenda in a serious way, to of course, get some space and funds for uh, doing the kind of structural reforms that we want. But I think it also is going to have to raise the question of taxing the working class as a whole. And the reason I raise that is partly because we're gonna need a lot of funds to do things like restructure the economy and have a green, green New Deal and improve healthcare and everything else. But also because part of creating a base for socialism is to be able to say to workers, we wanna have a shift from individual consumption not get rid of it, but have a shift from individual consumption to collective consumption. And that's what taxing workers is also about. Having a wealth tax uh, gives you some legitimacy in terms of doing that. If the wealthy are really gonna be taxed and workers are gonna be taxed too, then you've got a, a, a very large tax base that you can then use for collective consumption that will really benefit uh, workers uh, in particular. So I think those are all the kind of openings. I think there's uh, other openings uh, around labor that you said we were going to return to. So maybe I'll just uh, stop there and we can return to some of the labor openings because it's absolutely fundamental that we have to, to, to start talking not just about supporting working people, but building the kind of class power and social force to actually have the ability to change things. We're going to have to think about what this means for the, for the unions. Thanks, Sam, that's great. And yeah, we'll return to that. And, and I definitely like your uh, framing of openings. I think that's much better and gets at sort of what I was hoping to get at. Leo, we'll get you in on this as well. Well, what I would mainly say is that uh, it's not only what politicians have said and done to reproduce the capitalist economy in the face of this pandemic. Um, it's also how the discourse of the establishment media has changed in the course of this. The New York Times issued a stream of editorials uh, that sounded something to the left of the Labour Party manifesto. Um, uh, here in Canada, our so-called national newspaper, the newspaper of capital, the Globe and Mail, suddenly out of the blue, uh, came out with an editorial calling for pharmacare and denticare to be included in Canada's Medicare system. Um, you know, people, especially in the States, think we have this wonderful universal health care system, but it has never covered dental care. It doesn't co cover pharmacare. Uh, and, and to see why was that happening? And I think it gives us uh, a basis to go on in terms of trying to ensure that the outcome uh, as things continue uh, is a more progressive one than what we've lived through. You have to, and you see it. I mean, you see it with Boris Johnson, who not only at the beginning of the crisis said, there is such a thing as society, marking a break with Thatcher's Tina, right? But just this week, picking up the language of the Green New Deal, right? Um, and, and I think that reflects that what he's hearing from the city of London is not what the Tories were hearing from the city of London in 2010. The city of London was telling them that if the deficit isn't dealt with, 
if the size of the British debt ratio to GDP is not dealt with, there would be a run on the pound. I think the city is now very, very aware that it depends on state pump priming for this capitalist system in which the city is a central hub to continue to be reproduced. And insofar as everyone in the world is doing this enormous spending, their ability to discipline one state versus another, which is always what they do, what is the spread between Italian bonds and German bonds, et cetera, they can't do this as easily. So I think there's a lot, it's a lot likelier that one will be able to get progressive policies of a continuing kind out of this crisis, provided we don't lose our nerve. My impression is that Starmer is still in the headset that says that labor needs to look fiscally responsible. When in fact, it'll be the capitalist politicians, explicit capitalist politicians, who will not be fiscally responsible at all. Uh, and, and this is the great irony of the moment, but it should give us a lot of confidence in terms of making quite radical demands. One of the reasons for having a wealth tax is that it will scare the city of London because uh, uh, if, they, if they get a wealth tax, that is, if, and, and it'll be much worse for them than if they try to insist on fiscal austerity, right? Uh, so that may lead them not to be insisting as much on austerity if you threaten them with the wealth tax. So the more radical the demands, I think the better the outcome is likely to be. Thanks, Leo, that's great. Um, okay, so before we go on to our next question, I'm just going to take this opportunity to plug the TWT Supporters Network. We've had 70 new supporters since we started doing these calls, which has been a huge help in enabling us to continue to put them on. We're now planning to considerably scale up our work over the summer, but to make that happen, we're going to need your help. The current crisis means we can't guarantee receiving the funding we usually rely on to continue our work. So if you think political education like this is important and are in a position to do so, please donate the equivalent of one hour's wage per month at theworldtransform.org support. You can see that in the chat. Um, so as we already said, I, we do want to ask a question about, um, about labor and the, and the trade unions. Um, you know, we, We've all seen the decades long decline in trade union membership, strike activity um, and power across, across the global north, obviously most dramatic in the US um, and in its private sector, but fairly generalized. Um, and now we, have, uh, now we have this crisis coming at this moment of you know, almost historical uh, low point in, in labor's power. We have seen in the last few years, um, some maybe small, you know, reversals of this trend with some hopeful and successful collective activity in the public sector in particular, uh, thinking of the teacher strike in the US, um, and even, you know, in right to work straight states like West Virginia or Oklahoma, we've seen it among uh, low wage workers fighting for higher minimum wages and better conditions. Um, and many struggles also now have been, you know, fairly successful in linking worker demands with community demands. Um, but that was before March of this year. Um, and now, you know, and, and after the coronavirus, we are staring down the face of potentially double digit um, unemployment, even as, as, you know, even if, as Sam says, a lot of these programs will continue, but we're still, even in the UK, they're already talking about scaling them back. Um, and they are hitting already low wage and more precarious workers hardest. Uh, we are already seeing uh, lots of calls for a rollback of working conditions um, and wages from employers you know, everything from increased surveillance, pressures for lower wages, reduced pensions, other sorts of cost cutting. Um, I mean, what, what is the strategic path for trade unions out of this crisis? Um, how do unions respond and use the particular challenges like the spike in the numbers of, of the unemployed? Uh, do we need a, you know, a, new, a renewed focus um, on the unemployed and not just on, on existing members? Um, a renewed focus on conflicts over health and safety rather than just wages and, and the conditions of work. Um, you know, in short, how do we re rebuild working class power um, at the site of production today? 
And we'll get Sam, we'll get Sam first in on that. Okay, am I on? Yes, good. I, I, can I just say just, uh, just a quick comment on what Leo raised, which I generally agree with. Uh, I, I re it really is important to emphasize the space that we have, that there's a contradiction in what's been happening that gives the, us a certain space. I, I was trying to put it in terms of a social democratic sensibility because Leo's absolutely right. It's not just about policies, but there was there's a particular mood uh, that legitimates a lot of things they were saying. I think the only thing I uh, may disagree with Leo about is that I do think that the space is going to continue for a while, but I think that once the economy starts recovering uh, and will recover unevenly across countries, there's gonna be again, the question of uh, finance playing countries off against each other, about investors wanting to make sure that the uh, fiscal budget is getting in order. And I think there's gonna be a return uh, to those kinds of pressures. But in, in either case, our role is to take advantage of these openings with, uh, with confidence and, and, and to raise uh, the more radical questions. And, and it's a unique time. We haven't had a chance to do that before. So, so getting to the unions, um, however, however, wherever resistance emerges, whether it's from Black Lives Matter, whether it's from a youth movement, whether it's immigrants and a, a, a people of color in a particular, community, if the trade union movement isn't part of this, I don't see how it can really be sustained. So the question of uh, what happens within labor is critical. Uh, and uh, the question is whether it's a challenge to the labor movement, that this can be a unique moment for labor where it's been defeated for a significant, uh, a lot of decades, there's been sporadic fight back in various places, but they're still very limited. And the question is, can la will labor see this as a moment in which it has to really rethink itself and do things? Now, I'm very skeptical about that ch just happening from internal things, changes within labor. I think it will take some external things. Now, one of the things that Leo and I had been talking about the other day is the importance of using this moment and the kind of legitimacy you talked about earlier that low paid workers have gotten through this crisis uh, to emphasize the need for unionization. Now, normally I wouldn't stress that density itself makes all that difference. It's important, very important, but Canada has twice as much, its density levels are twice as high as the United States, for example, and there's a lot less energy in the United States. It's not just density, the difference is that suddenly saying that there's gonna be a chance to organize something that hasn't happened for generations by removing some of the barriers puts unions in the position of having to say, we have to take advantage of this. Whether it's to compete with other unions or whether it's to say uh, we're dying otherwise. And what that might mean is that we have the kind of crusade to really organize people that happened in the thirties. In the thirties, the miners uh, being worried about being isolated uh, hired a hundred organizers to go out and organize steel. And it's gonna be that kind of an attitude that's gonna be very you know, crucial. And if that happens, then you're beginning to revive the trade union movement because then you're changing what the union is in terms of its priorities. Uh, you're changing the union in terms of really thinking about having to build the class. You're bringing all kinds of new leaders and activists who are gonna emerge from this, which is crucial. You're gonna bring a new blood. And you're gonna bring in a lot of very strategic sectors because it isn't just the public sector that's strategic. You've got warehouses, you've got the whole distribution network. So I think the question of uh, you know, really making a fight to remove barriers to unions can have that kind of spur. The other dimension of it is that uh, there are a lot, a lot of contradictions in unions. You know, they're particular organizations, they're focused on their own members, they organize people not on the basis of people agreeing to some politics, but on the basis of uh, being in the same workplace. Uh, they're dependent on their employers and transforming unions. It isn't just a question of union bureaucracy. It's a question of members themselves who feel dependent on their own corporation, who feel that they look to the short term because they're practical uh, and, and they can't look to the long term. All those kinds of issues 
mean it's really critical to think in terms of how we organizationally can interact with workplaces and unions, how we can penetrate, how we can connect uh, workplaces, uh, how we can bring in history and international examples. And that lays out the importance of uh, organizations like Momentum and the DSA to orient themselves to thinking about how do we link up with workers and play that kind of a role. And I think that that will be uh, a critical in, in terms of thinking about all of this. I would also just add like in, in terms of the public sector, it's exciting to see uh, people learning about how class extends beyond the workplace and how important that is, but we've still got a long way to go. With the Chicago teachers, for example, there are a lot of socialists who had a bias to become teachers. And so in the Chicago teachers, there were socialists who had experience in the community and had a socialist perspective that were part of the changes that happened. But the reality is that although this did influence various places like in LA and Oakland and Seattle and Milwaukee, that, uh, that did show also that people from DSA and progressives were involved, but it didn't change the union as a whole. It didn't actually change Chicago as a whole. And that requires a larger organization because the Chicago teachers are so overwhelmed with just defending themselves that they couldn't do that. And one of the crucial things is, uh, and I can speak for a lot of Canadian unions, is that they're all sensitive now to, to the fact that they have to, to get the community on side. But there's a difference between getting the community on side by announcing that you love the community or by saying, we're actually going to put community issues on the bargaining table and that we're gonna commit resources to organizing the community because the community isn't organized. It's not an institution waiting to form an alliance with you. And although some of that is happening independently, it really would also require unions to say, we're actually gonna put some money and funding into that. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, stop there and we can come back to it, you know, around, uh, the questions maybe of the Green Jobs Oshawa issue and uh, the environment that I've been looking at. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. No, that was lots in there. Leo. Uh, I, I think that there's a strong basis for thinking uh, that there will be a significant shift in the balance of class forces uh, uh, motivated and, and realized by a militancy uh, and a confidence in the organized working class coming out of this pandemic. Um, uh, Ursula Hughes has an essay in next year's Socialist Register. I just was reading the draft of it today. And she points out that in the UK, and I'll just talk about the UK, uh, even before the pandemic, uh, the, a new union emerged, the App Drivers and Couriers Union, the ADCU in the UK, right? Uh, with an international organization by 2019 of app-based transport workers. Um, the the uh, struggles we saw in the last few years in Britain uh, of low-paid workers from McDonald's to Amazon uh, was already an indication of this. Um, people don't know that the TUC um, in, in the last year reported an increase of 100,000 in members in a single year. Um, but uh, as Ursula points out, and this is really interesting, after the pandemic hit, the traffic on the TUC's Join a Union website page in May 2020 was six times higher than in May 2019. And female membership is at a record high in the UK um, uh, at, at you know, some 3.7 million. And most of them are new to trade unionism. And a lot of these are care workers who've come in via unison. So this is really very, very interesting and important in terms of a changing composition of the class. And I think out of all of the, if you like, you know, soft propaganda around essential workers, uh, people will come out of this, however, with a sense of confidence, with a sense of uh, we deserve a shift in the balance of class forces. 
and I think that's really, really something important to build on. Now, so that said, that can only go so far as Sam was saying, unless the unions change themselves. And I would say that most about the socialist led unions. Uh, you should expect it most of Unite. Uh, Unite buried its head in the sand around conversion, uh, opposing uh, Corbyn's position on getting rid of Trident uh, because its membership is involved there uh, up in Scotland in the Clyde. Uh, rather than taking the initiative and calling for the conversion with those enormously skilled workers uh, of, of uh, uh, that plant to what should have been done, the production of uh, the kinds of apparatus that was needed in the pandemic. Uh, so a politicization, not only at the base, but even of the union leadership is going to be needed uh, if this really is going to be a shift in the balance of class forces that will lead on to a new politics. Uh, although I think even without that, uh, it will lead on to some new policies, including, uh, I'm hoping, some favorable labor policies, uh, right, to, right to unionize policies. Actually, I just have a very quick follow-up follow up to Sam on that, because I think that raises uh, Leo sort of naturally raised that question of um, of transition and of retooling, um, and I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about your work with Green Jobs Asha, which you flagged a little bit there. Um, you know, as as this kind of worker community coalition, maybe tell people in the UK who might not be familiar with Asha, which had a large uh, one of the largest car assembly plants in North America at one time, uh, shut down and is now producing, you know, masks on a very 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 limited uh, number. Um, but has long been, you know, there's been a campaign in that city for, for a couple of years now um, to transition uh, that plant to green production as part of a sort of just transition and the Green New Deal and what that looks like now in the context of the pandemic and the context of this kind of retooling. Okay. Uh, let me just comment quickly on what Leo said, which I think is, uh, it's important. I guess I see it more in terms of there really is potential. Uh, I don't see it yet in the numbers in the US or Canada at all. And I see it as, uh, uh, it still is very difficult in spite of the fact that it's very clear that Amazon workers, for example, are much more interested in unionization than ever before. It's still very difficult. And then there's other sectors that are very important. Google workers uh, are, have really been thinking about unionization. And it hasn't been because they're looking at uh, the problems with the wages and benefits is because they really want to fight over uh, social justice issues. They want to fight over whistleblowing legislation. And so this question of politicization and uh, class perspective uh, is, is really uh, fundamental. The potential is there. And I think that if the trade union movement, the existing trade union movement, gets involved in these struggles, uh, it, will, it will get a cachet. It will be a way of inspiring young people to see the trade union movement as where it's really at if you're fighting for social justice. And that hasn't been there for a long time. Uh, on the question of the Green Jobs Oshawa thing, uh, one of the problems I think with the environmental movement, uh, for all it's done, which has been terrific, important around raising consciousness about the environment, uh, when it raises question, questions like a just transition, it's abstract. For workers, it's just an abstract thing. They don't see, well, how are you gonna do that? You don't control the economy, there's no planning. What does that actually mean? And when the Oshawa plant closed, we had to confront that. And we had a number of principles that we wanted to look at. One principle was that the union had just made major concessions uh, to get job guarantees. And of course they didn't get the job guarantees. So that raises the question of, we have to start thinking beyond begging the companies again and just starting another campaign to say, please GM, will you come back? So we raised the question of public ownership. We had to raise, we had to get beyond the question of saying, we just, just wanna make what we used to make, whatever it is, because we want jobs. If we're gonna mobilize the public and if we're gonna think in terms of class, we had to think about the fact 
that we don't want to take over a plant and then produce something that's competing with Mexico and the U.S. in terms of we really need something that, that involves government procurement so there'll be a market for it and related to planning. Uh, I've got a note here that my connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? There, can thank you. you Sam. Yeah, we, we can hear you, but without video, we'll be better. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so so uh, I, I was saying that we had to go beyond the company. We had to go beyond just uh, whatever they were making. We had to go beyond competition and start thinking about planning. Um, and uh, we had to emphasize that if we're thinking about what's socially useful, we really need to have a manufacturing capacity. Because if we're thinking about the environment as an example, uh, it means changing everything about how we live, work, play, travel. And that means having some material capacity to do those things. So what we were putting on the agenda as a focal point was the question of conversion. And we emphasized uh, at that particular plant, we talked about making medical equipment for an aging population. We didn't think about the pandemic at the time. Uh, that didn't occur to us at the time. And we talked about uh, fleet vehicles, not individual vehicles, uh, but fleet electric vehicles, postal vans, utility vans, uh, minibuses that supplement the public transit system, ambulances. We did a feasibility study to give it some credibility. Uh, and we raised the question of conversion as a strategy that pulled a lot of things together. It forced us to ask uh, who controls the economy. It forced us to talk about planning. It forced us to get involved. Uh, it created the potential to get involved in very specific uh, battles. Um, it raised the question of restructuring and manufacturing capacity. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we shifted our argument to converting things for uh, protective equipment. We had a press conference immediately and talked about masks. Uh, GM shortly after that actually began to make masks. It wasn't because we were so powerful that it happened, but it did mean that a lot of people who had said, uh, you're dreaming, were now saying, well, your idea obviously made sense, it was practical. Um, right now, what we're trying to do is both deepen things in Oshawa by doing more community organizing and by trying to get more workers involved. Uh, we've been building solidarity with the healthcare sector. We just had a car cavalcade that went uh, to hospitals and long-term care facilities before it went to the GM facility. But we also concluded we have to really become, get out of Oshawa. We have to make this larger or it's just gonna be another ghetto. So we've been talking to other communities like Windsor where there are auto plants under threat. We've been talking to people in Alberta where the oil fields are about what are they gonna do about converting as oil falls off the cliff. We've been talking about Quebec which usually has no ties to English Canada but there's a strong environmental movement. And we're gonna have a conference that's gonna involve all these people. It will have all the major environmental groups because these activities have given us a lot of credibility with the environmental uh, movement. We'll have youth organizations, we'll have people who wanna talk about conversion of arms. So we're trying to broaden it that way. I, I do wanna, again, wanna just say some sobering things about this though. Uh, the obvious way of, have, of dealing with this from the beginning beginning would have been to just take over the plant. That would have put it on the national agenda and just, just demand things. The fact is we didn't have that kind of ability to do this. The union was not only not interested, but opposed. So uh, we had to figure out how to really make this an issue when we didn't have that kind of power in the plant. And the reason for this, uh, you know, aside from questions of the union, was that after going through so many defeats, people were gonna turn around on a dime. Their expectations had been lowered. They thought this was a great idea, but didn't think some rump group could change it. Um, and also a lot of them were starting to get used to the fact that they lost their jobs and didn't wanna get their hopes up again. Because being honest, we weren't promising them that this kind of a campaign would win. It was something that was necessary to try. So they didn't wanna get their hopes up again and faded away. Some of that is changing, but I wouldn't exaggerate it. So the point of this wasn't just that we could win something if we organized around it. It was to put something on the agenda for people to talk about that raised larger questions of links to the environment, uh, planning and uh, having to take on private property, of fighting concessions, of uh, 
of having some alternative that people could start thinking about uh, that would give them hope and the need, if you want, if you see this alternative as making sense of building the kind of power, political power that could do this. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Sam. A lot of lessons there. Um, okay, I'm just going to finish off with a couple of questions that have been coming up in the chat. Um, the first one is that uh, your, discuss your previous discussion sparked a bit of a debate on the role of different types of unions. It's kind of traditional unions versus new unions. So kind of, you know, the problems that you have with the old unions of kind of like leadership, political education. Then you've got kind of new, new unions which are starting up like U UVW and the IWGP. Be, um, who are, you know, kind of able, much more able to represent outsourced workers, more migrant workers, um, you know, they've got much more participation, much better at organizing and mobilizing their base. So just what's your, what's your view on this kind of new old union dynamic uh, in dealing in kind of confronting with the crisis coming up? Let's start with Leo. No, no, Sam's the person to answer that question. Sam? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'd, I'd be careful of seeing it in just those terms. I mean, part of the difference between private and public sector unions is that private sector unions are disciplined by the market and public sector unions by their very nature have to get the public on side because it's about uh, the public paying taxes to support their wages and the public sector not being in a position where hospitals uh, are going to move. On the other hand, there's a lot of private sector unions which are so, also aren't as vulnerable to globalization in the retail sector, for example, and in the warehouses section. So I, I don't think that that explains everything. Um, I would also emphasize that most of the old unions that I know in the private sector their base is growing very rapidly in terms of people of color and women. That's who they're actually organizing. So there's also uh, a, a, a potential there to say, look, if you really want to organize these people, you have to broaden your arguments and start dealing with those larger questions. And I think a lot of unions uh, have done that in their educationals. The question is whether that really gets into their bargaining perspective and how far it goes into really developing a class perspective. And at the same time, you know, the public sector unions and some of the new unions, there's also a mixed bag there. I mean, these are unions in transition. What's exciting is that something is happening and the question of though that something inspiring others. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's still uh, very uneven. And the question is whether, you know, the, Unions could be particular organizations in the 50s and 60s and win just by worrying about themselves. And they also could inspire both politically and economically others to copy them. So that wasn't a bad strategy. That, those days are over. Unions cannot win unless they're thinking about larger class uh, uh, ties. They cannot win just by isolating themselves. The public sector unions cannot win if they're just going into bargaining and saying, we've got all the muscle and the private sector unions can't. And the question is, can unions begin to, I, I think a lot of unions aren't thinking about this seriously yet, while some unions are. The question is, can there be a discussion in unions about how they absolutely have to change if they're gonna survive the coming period? They have really suffered in the last few decades. And in that sense, it's an existential crisis because if they just continue this way, they will become irrelevant. But if they recognize that this is a moment with all kinds of opportunities in terms of workers who wanna be organized, in terms of their own members, whether they're interested in a different kind of union, if they recognize that this is an, a unique opportunity and try to take advantage of it, uh, then I think there is some hope. But I would also stress that it's very important how the left intersects with this, how the DSA and how the momentum helps further this along.
Leo, do you have any more responses? Yeah, could I say in this respect that I, I think people in the UK uh, should be looking at what is now going to happen with Brexit uh, from the perspective of the class contradictions that it is going to raise, especially vis-a-vis -vis trade unionism. Uh, the motivation for Brexit on the part of the Tory right was in fact an industrial strategy. It was to get out of the legal protections for workers in the European Union and try to develop a Singapore on the North Sea. Uh, it only makes sense uh, from the perspective of being able to get British workers to compete with Vietnamese workers on a dollar a day, etc. cetera. Uh, in the context that we're now talking about, however, uh, with all of the evidence that has been produced of the lack of health and safety uh, in so many uh, workplaces by the pandemic, uh, in light of the confidence that low-paid workers will have who have very bad labor regulations already, it seems to me there's going to be a major tension, a major contradiction between carrying through Brexit in a way that's oriented to reducing labor regulations and labor power and labor capacity in a class at a class level and what this pandemic is going to yield i think on the basis of what i was talking about before that there was already a movement in this direction what is going to yield by way of demanding better regulations an easier path to unionization uh, and greater power around uh, 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 health and safety and other labor process issues. So I think people should be looking at Brexit. And I think part of the problem of uh, the British left was they tended to look at Brexit in terms of, are we part of the, the, the good world or not part of the good world? Um, uh, are we abandoning our comrades in Europe? Uh, looking at it quite rightly, of course, in terms of what it means in terms of being open to uh, migration, uh, but not looking at it nearly enough uh, in, in terms of these class contradictions. Uh, and people really should be aware of that now and, and should be writing about it uh, and, 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 and uh, blogging about it, uh, because the mainstream media doesn't, of course, have this analytic understanding at all. Thank you. Okay, so just going to come on to the final kind of million dollar question that's been coming up a lot in the chat as well, which is about this kind of the key issue about, you know, whether to stay in the Labour Party and try to transform it or whether to organise outside it. And I know that this is the, the main difference from the kind of the, the book that you wrote in the 1980s, The End of Parliamentary Socialism, the conclusion was you need to start organising outside. Whereas the conclusion of searching for socialism is more that we need to, you know, both work outside, but also stay and fight within the Labour Party. We know that we're faced with, you know, at least four more years um, out of power. Um, and, you know, now given that, you know, we're being increasingly marginalised within the Labour Party. Um, what would you say? How would you update your conclusions, given the kind of the recent, up, the recent kind of events? I really don't think it's a matter of a change in Collins and my strategic perspective. It's a matter of changed political conditions. Uh, in 1997, the first edition of the book, and even in 2001, uh, there was no left cohesive organization. There was virtually no sediment left over from that remarkable mobilization uh, in the 1970s of the new left inside the Labour Party. Uh, the campaign group was tiny, uh, uh, didn't have a clear policy or ideological focus. Uh, the Scargill attempt to form a new party had gone uh, embarrassingly nowhere. Uh, and, you know, the Trotskyist parties clearly were not turning themselves into mass parties, even in the conditions of neoliberalism. Uh, so, uh, you know, one couldn't say uh, that inside the Labour Party that there was an institutional basis for socialists to coalesce around, right? 
nor could one say that the old attempts to create better Leninist parties was going anywhere. Uh, so our, our conclusion was, look, we've got to get on our bikes and try to start evolving new mass socialist parties, non-Leninist ones, but not parliamentarist ones for the 21st century. But that was a very vague and abstract demand. It didn't have institutional roots. What you've got out of the legacy of this remarkable resurgence of the labor left very briefly, the labor new left inside the party via Corbyn, you have an institutional legacy, not only in momentum, but as we see it right here in the world transform. Right? There is something institutionally concrete that has come out of this. And if people just haul off and leave as individuals or attempt to form new little party group of schools, what they are giving up on is that institutional legacy. As I said at the outset, it could well be that a Labour Party led by Star Starmer cannot live with a socialist momentum as a viable campaigning organization inside it. If that's the case, then there will be a split and there will be a poll for people to leave the Labour Party and join a new socialist party built around this institutional legacy. We're far away from that. But it does mean that the main thrust for people staying in should not be so much, oh darn, we didn't elect enough people on the NEC, or we need to orient all of our efforts to getting this or that policy passed at the next party conference. It absolutely needs to be campaign mobilization, links with the community, changing CLPs into centers of community life. That's what it needs to be. It can't be electoralist at the moment. And it also can't be trapped within the confines of winning victories inside the party apparatus. And then who knows where it'll go. All right. I think that's, I think that's who knows where it goes is a great note to, uh, to end on. Um, two two months of, uh, of of wisdom condensed into um, into a, <laughs> into a statement. Um, no, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leo. Um, I, I we we will make one more final plug um, while we still have people here to join the TWT Supporters Network. Uh, again, as we've been saying, we really do think political education on the left, and hopefully these uh, webinars have shown that political education on the left is more important than ever. Um, the link will, will be in the chat one more time if you are able to, and if you have uh, the means to do it, please do join our supporters network. Uh, we do want to thank all of you for joining us, whether it's been for one session or for five. Um, we want to thank, first of all, Leo Panich for being so generous with his time and distilling his uh, lifelong engagement with the Labour Party. In Um, it's been really humbling to see how many of the, of the issues we face now are not so new and to take inspiration from the past. And thanks to the World Transformed for keeping these spaces for political education alive during these really challenging times. Thanks especially to Rory Payton, who has been providing technical and logistical support for the series the whole time. Thanks so much, Rory. Um, and thanks finally to Perzo Books for your support. So thanks everyone again for tuning in for the last time and good night. <laughs>